Hey everybody, it's Natalie Alicia Gold with the Gold Standard and today I'm here with my dear friend Yael Trush. Yael is an MBA, money coach, and international speaker who helps Jewish women live a joyful, richer life. I'm already feeling richer and more joyful. <laughs> it's amazing. She's the creator of the Financial Transformation Program, Jewish Money Makeover, in Spanish and English, teaching women to monetize their soul's calling build wealth, and become great custodians of that wealth. Beautiful. She's the host of the award-winning podcast, Jewish Latin Princess, which I was so happy to be a part of, where she interviews the world's most uniquely talented Jewish women. Thank you very much, Yael. Mm -hmm. Dubbed by her podcast guests and listeners, the Jewish Oprah, Yael is an insightful, honest, and sensitive communicator who brings out the best in her guests and extracts powerful life lessons for guests and listeners alike. She authors the personal finance column, Jewish Money Matters, for Chabad.org, and contributes regularly to numerous publications at her blog, JewishLatinPrincess.com. A wife, mother of four, and she looks that good, and a native of Puerto Rico, Yael has globetrotted from New York to Argentina to Chile to China to Israel and back. Yael, where is next? Where is next? I don't know, but it involves water. That is for sure. It has to have a beautiful beach that I could wake up every morning and just look at it. That has to be my view. That's Only if you and me are sitting next to each other. Let's do it. We can have the boat together. We can like two for one kind of deal. I love it. Let's do it. Let's do it. I'm so happy to be here, Natalie. This is I'm awesome. So happy that you're here. And I will tell you all that when I was on Yale's podcast, her ability to get to what is inside of you <laughs> is unmatched. It's unbelievable. That is very kind. That is very kind. Thank you. We had a really nice time. That episode is airing in actually two weeks, right after Rosh Hashanah, right after the Jewish holiday, um, the Jewish New Year. And yeah, I mean, it's you say that, and I've been hearing it since the beginning from my guests. It's like, it's, I guess this is why I do it. There's something I love having deep conversations with people and I love getting to the essence of who they are. And it's just, it's just me, you know? Yeah. Al, you know, what I will say is that when you tell people to find their soul calling and bring it to the forefront, that is what you have done. You are walking billboard for the exact work you do in the world. So that is not so often that we find and you, know, you know, it's so funny that you say that, Natalie, because I think for myself growing up, that was always kind of a pain point, which explains why I'm doing what I'm doing. I was one of the, you know how there's people who they're born knowing exactly what they want to do with their lives, right? Okay, so that's one third of the population. And I have friends like that. And I was very, very jealous of those friends. And, you know, there's this one friend of mine who always wanted to be an architect. To this day, she's an architect. She's very successful. Like, and then there's the other two thirds of the population. We just don't know. We're multi-talented. We don't really know. And moreover, a lot of our talents aren't, weren't, maybe nowadays it's changed, but certainly when I was growing up, there weren't things that, you know, people could really put like a, a, a tag on them. They couldn't label them. You couldn't box them, you know? And so you didn't know where you fit. And so I did a lot of things growing up. I studied economics. I studied international relations. I didn't really want to be in government. I didn't want to be in politics. I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. So I did investment banking for a while. And would you believe that I hated it? I mean, come on. No. Do I look like an investment banker to you? <laughs> well, actually, I think you would get a hell of a deal and do amazing work. So I'll tell you why. Because I'm a people person. So I used to do that work. And guess what? Everybody, all of my superiors were like, you really should be doing client management services. And I'm like, I know, like, when do I get transferred? Right. So they're like, why don't you, we've never done this, but why don't you go to our client management office in Argentina? Because that's where the deals get originated here. We just do the grunt work, you know, but that's where the client work is. And I had this awesome opportunity to go live in Argentina for a year working for my, my employer in their Argentina office. And I was like, ah, this is where, you know, like it was just closer. The song yeah. was singing, but it's, yeah, it's yeah, so yeah. low. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there was a combination of, yes, I'm a people person. 
I love being with clients. I definitely, but there was some, and then there was the lifestyle, which helped. I mean, come on, live in Latin America and South America. It was like pretty epic, pretty nice, right? But there was still something. And so I end up moving to Miami. I decide I don't want to go back to Manhattan. I don't want to do numbers. I don't want to do banking. But, you know, you're young. You really don't know. I got a really good um, um, job offer paying a lot of money for a startup. It was the days the internet boom and the internet was moving in Latin America. It was before the, you know, it was like heyday. Okay. So I got this really good job. It was still kind of like finance and numbers and VC type of work. Eh, I was pretty miserable. I mean, I was living in more closer to my culture. There was definitely more of the lifestyle was easier than Manhattan, even though I love New York, nothing against New York but I still didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. So I, what do I do? I go and do an MBA because I get a full scholarship and I'm like, well, I might as well do it, right? And the Latin American economy was like crashing and I was like, I don't know how long I'm gonna have this job. So I might as well go to school because I have no idea what I wanna do with, what I wanna do with my life. But still in school, I was like, I'm creative. I'm a people person. And this, is, this stuff is like so, like something's missing here for me. So long story short, I end up not really knowing what to do. I want to do art management because I loved art. So I want to do art management. So I go to NYU with a full scholarship. I combine my MBA with like their school of art management. I think I want to work in the art world. And I really want to be like the brains behind the business of art. And then I get married, which was a really good thing. <laughs> and it was a really good thing. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> yes, it was a really good thing. I meet my husband, wonderful man. I get married. And then I kind of like, I don't know what I want to do with my life, but I start a family. So through the years, I just started teaching other women, just stuff that I knew. And very often people came to me with questions about Judaism. And I'm like, why? And like, and spiritual questions. And I don't know why, but like, this just kept bouncing to me. And other spiritual leaders were referring women to me. So I started hosting classes and this and that. And eventually when I moved back to the States with my husband, I was running a company with him that he started. I helped him start his startup and I was working with him. And on the side, I started a blog. It was the days of blogging. I started a Jewish lifestyle blog and I did that for a while. And then I got called to start speaking and I would go all over the world to Guatemala, to Venezuela, to Colombia, to Miami, to speak in front of Jewish women, just really motivational speaking and combining, you know, Jewish wisdom with practical, you know, fem female issues and whatnot. Until I started saying, what's the pain point? Like at the end of the day, I'm a businesswoman. So I was like, where's the business in what I'm doing? Yeah, I'm making money as a speaker. Yeah, I can make a little bit as a writer, but like, there's, what's the thing that I'm helping women solve. And I kept telling my husband, that's connecting yeah. all these places and all these things. Yeah. What's the thread? And at the further I dug, I felt like there were like a few things that people struggle with. And there was one that I was really passionate about. And that was their financial life. That was money. And when I, and whenever I started to talk about money and I would like infuse it with Jewish wisdom and with my own personal experience and whatnot, people would be like, wait, 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 I want more. Like, tell me more. Well, what you went through that. And, and how does that work? And what does Jewish wisdom have to say about that? And I, I want that. I want more wealth in my life. And I'm having problems with my husband about money. And can you tell me more? And I was like, oh, this is what I should be doing. Universe. Yeah. We're calling for you. This uh -huh. is it. But you know, Yael, half of life or less, God willing, we find it sooner, is discovering how the gifts match up. Yep. And then the other half is giving away that gift to the world. Exactly. 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 And what's so interesting through all of my interviews, when I interview, when I interviewed you and when I interview other women, right, I'm always looking for that point where like, their soul's calling is really being like, it's, it's being shown, like they're serving. It's, it's, you see it through the, through the questions that I ask and you see it through the way they talk about their work. Right. And it, it, like you said, it all ties in so beautifully because when people come to my podcast, they hear about these amazing women who are doing so many beautiful things, that unique thing that's really comes from the depth of their soul. And it has nothing to do with religiosity per se or, or observance. It's, we all have 
a way that we serve, right? And some of us, like you said, actually discover that and serve the world with it. And that's what I want to leave listeners with. Look, look how she's found that thing and look how she's using her unique talents and her unique experience and her challenges. We're all so unique. We have, we have a soul print. We do. And, and, and so it's really gratifying to have listeners comment all the time and say, wow, I, I just learned so much from that that guest and, I, and the way you pulled that out of them or whatever. So I feel like, I, what can I tell you? I love what I'm doing. I just love it. I love it. I love you. You know, like, <laughs> as you know, when someone is so passionate, I have a hero and I call her mother. Thank you for that cup. I love mm. it. My daughter gave it to me. Fantastic. It's the best. Look, as a mother, as a wife, as a business owner, as someone who is serving her soul's purpose in the world, how do you, and, and also to the point of like love, when you are so passionate about what you do, everyone just falls in love with a person like that. Mm-hmm. Because it brings out, you know, they say if you spot it, you got it, good and bad. So true. And when someone is so inspiring and so infused and and you know as oprah says you make your cup runneth over mm-hmm. so king, da- king david said it <laughs> it's all look it's all from the torah there's nothing new under the sun mm-hmm. and when you can be like that it is just it literally fills the cup of others mm-hmm. and that love like that like i feel like i've known you forever right it's because you are sharing your authentic self and everyone wants to be more like that. Thank you. Thank you. And I think, yeah, we're all craving that. And, and I, 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 I'm glad you said that because it's, it's needed more than ever. I feel like, especially with women, and I can say this because I've gone through this, right? There's things that happen as girls. There's this programming, this, you know, it comes from our parents, from our, you know, environment at school, whatever it might be, right? We tend to kind of like not want the spotlight and that might be too assertive and too aggressive and too forward, right? And why don't you hide that a little bit? Like, you know, don't be so, and, and what ends up happening is that we stop shining, we stop shining. And, you know, people say the future is female. Hello, the present is female. Like 100%. there is a feminine energy that is needed and it's needed now. It was needed yesterday. Like we right, have to. Right, right, right now. <laughs> right now. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, Alan, what is beautiful is when we're talking about dimming that light, like I have very good lighting right now. But the fact is, if I put shit on top of this lighting, my <laughs> clothes and blah, 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 blah. It's going to get dimmer. Yep. It's not that we're not plugged in. It's not that the light is not shining. But what have we put on top of that light to make it as if it's not even there? Or we think it's not even there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Healing back the layers, the, you know, the onion I to know. get to the root of the light. And that, correct me if I'm wrong, but is the essence of Kabbalah. Yep. Exactly. Because that's the essence of who we are. And like you said, we have so much garbage that we put into it. And if we would only see ourselves the way our creator sees us, if we would be able to see like, you are a gem, you're a diamond, you are light, literally, you're a piece of infinity. You are a piece of infinity. You're always plugged. It's always there. There's a little schmutz here and there. Like we got to clear the schmutz. Clear we the schmutz. Take a that- shower every day, right? Exactly. Okay. Every other day in quarantine <laughs> time. Okay. Nobody is judging. But the fact is, we have to clean our bodies, and so too we have to clear our souls sometimes. A hundred percent. And that's where the work is. I'm sorry. It, nobody said it was going to be easy. We got to clear the stuff so that we can shine. We can live a meaningful, purposeful life. And it's a journey. It's an entire journey. We're, I'm not done yet, right? This is just a stage I'm in. Um, Look, I, I love that. And to me, when I started waking up to the divinity within myself and that God is the spark of light within me and that I owe it to the universe Correct. to shine and to give my light. Because, you know, yeah, a lot of people are the walking dead. Mm-hmm. 
and they have so given up on who they are. They don't even know who they are. They don't even know what they want or they want it, but they're like, I'm manifesting. I'm manifesting. Nothing is manifesting. Look, manifesting is not just about sitting in bed. Um, Correct. It's about getting your vessel, yourself, to a point where you're ready to receive that. Mm -hmm. So there's two things with what you said. Number one, yes. Like you have to do the work. Like Hamaser Waikar, like the action is the most important thing. I always tell people like action moves you further. You can't just sit and wait for divine inspiration to come. Yes, we all need our moments of quiet. A hundred percent we need it. Okay. That's why there's something called the Sabbath. That's what everybody should find. It doesn't matter religious observance. Everybody should find times where they can get like the divine download, you know, like where they can, you know, connect, but you have to do, you have to do. And then the other thing to what you just said that you just reminded me is, you know, Natalie, we wake up in the morning and we, the first words that we utter as Jewish people is thank you. And we say, thank you for giving me back my soul. Your faithfulness is great. And that always stops me on my tracks because to think that something much higher than you has faith in you, despite of all the garbage, despite of your craziness, your weaknesses, your whatever schmutz is there, that thing, whatever you want to call it, the super infinite intelligence, the universe, God, whatever you want to call it, that has faith in me. I mean, get up and do stuff because again, the world is counting on you. You are needed. So it's, it's, it's about having that sense of I am purposeful and I'm meaningful I'm with everything I have and I have to do stuff. So now what am I going to do? Because there is purpose in me being, being here. Somebody needs me here. The day you were born is the day the universe said, you matter. You are needed. There's nobody else in the world that could do what Natalie came here to do. Moses couldn't do it. Your aunt couldn't do it. Your husband can't do it. Your kids can do it. Nobody, only you, right? So that really is where it's at. We all have to walk with that. What do you, how do you bridge that gap for people with the practicality of the wisdom that you've learned and the money coaching that you do, right? Your investment banking background, your MBA from NYU Stern, like one of the best schools in the world that you got totally for free, which I love <laughs> and want to get back to. You know, how do you make it like feeling of touching? Someone can actually take this and do A, B, C and get to a specific place. Yeah. Yeah. So excellent question. So first of all, it's the first part is what we've talked about. You have to understand your worth. Okay. Now you also have to understand that in order for you to be in this world, money is one of the tools for you to serve the world. Okay. So let's remove all the ickiness and all the garbage that we have around money. And let's get very clear on what money means. And money is a neutral tool that the universe or God is sending you so that you could create impact. Now you have to go and create that impact. You have to find how your unique talents, going back to point number one, can serve the world. And guess what? When you're adding value, the money's rolling in, right? Oh, yes. And then you have to actually be responsible with, for that, with that money, right? So there's different way, things that you have to do, not just you have to trust in the ultimate source, that the money ultimately, you put your effort, the, the money comes from the ultimate source. And you have to show the source that you're a responsible custodian, that you're taking steps, that you are l allowing that money to flow, right? You're giving, you're doing charity, whatever that might be. For many people, it's 10%, whatever it is, but you're keeping it flowing. You're not, you don't hold on to it, right? At the same time, you look at your value system. You say, what are the things that are really meaningful and important in my life? Am I actually financing those things? You know, Natalie, very often we think, and we do this with our time, right? we think we're living a life aligned with our values. And if we, somebody looked up at our bank statements or our calendars, what, what would they see? This person, what, is, what does she value? You know, like, so we have to get really clear on what kind of life do I want to lead? And am I financing that? So if my marriage is really important for me, like, 
Am I investing in that marriage? Am I going out with my husband? Am I going out on dates? Am I take my family is important? What are we doing to nurture the family unit, right? It's not to say that you can't go to Nordstrom's and get yourself a beautiful pair of shoes. I mean, there's val beauty is a value also, but be very clear what those values are and finance them. And then there's a piece which is you want long term, you want you want a future for yourself and your family. You got to make that money work for you. Uh, and, and this is so much of what you talk about also, you know, we have to take those steps and investing, for example, is one of those really, really important steps and everything else that you teach in the way in, in between, but all of it, the practical and the spiritual is super important. And I think those are, those would be key pieces that people have to have. What I love that you just said, Yael, is about the calendar and truly taking and your accounts. It starts with an inventory. Yep. And a lot of people skip that step. They don't want to look at the reality. And, you know, look, we love our shows and you're way ahead of where I am. I'm just starting this one. And the fact is, to me, someone amazing coming on my show is top priority. When I'm on this, I feel, whether it be as a guest or as the host, connected in such a big way. Mm -hmm. And I also am finding that I'm making more and more space for that in my calendar. So if it's not scheduled, it doesn't happen. And that's also not just day to day. That's life. That is life. And by the way, when it comes to your money, if you don't schedule times where you're actually going to look at your money and you're actually going to think about your money, like what's coming in, how much do I want to generate? How much am I saving? Well, how are my investments doing? There's certain things you need to be doing regularly. You can't just ignore your money. And a lot of us, and I could say this from personal experience, I used to just ignore my money. Like I remember my first investment banking bonus I got, it was a pretty nice chunk of change. It was something like $22,000. Not bad for being 21, right? Almost 22. Amazing. Right? Pretty good. I had no idea what to do with that money, even though I was in the field. So what do you do? You go ask a friend who asked her husband, because you know, men know better, right? Because it was wow. a boys, it was a boys club back then. But not so much anymore. I think the industry has definitely evolved. Um, but still, there's a lot of that. And I just go and I put that money and I invest it. I give it to somebody at a, at a bank. And I just didn't ask questions. Can you believe it? I did not ask questions. I I'll literally believe it. Right? <laughs> I believe and, that. And I left that money there. And would you believe that after a few, a bunch of years, I'm like, how come my money, I do remember he said something about growth, right? Because I was pretty young. And he said, we're going to invest in some mutual funds, a lot of growth for you. I'm like, how come that money really never grew? <laughs> and then I started investigating and I start seeing that the fees that I'd been paying all those years were so high. And I'm like, yeah, L, you idiot. Like you should know better, right? It's not rocket science to find this stuff out, but it's just called ignoring it. You know, it's totally ignore. Or if you make a, if you're a high earner, I just posted on Instagram actually that just because you're a high earner doesn't mean you're building wealth, right? Most you, of the time they're the ones with the least amount saved. Incredible. You could be earning a lot of money and still be in two months, you know, two months short of bankruptcy. Like, you know, you don't, if you don't, know how to properly take care of that money, then you're not really building wealth. 100% yeah. And people say, well, I'm going to get a bigger house. I'm going to get a, you know, another place by the beach. I'm going to get a nicer car. And those are all, you know, look, the house traditionally oh. has been an appreciating asset. Okay. But those days, yeah, I really believe are over. Mm. There is no, I bought it for 200,000 and now it's worth 1.2. I mean, right now, if you can enter the market, it's at 1.2. And the question is with, with, you know, salaries not going up for the people who are working, how are they possibly going to afford that? Right. So that's the thing. Like, like the salaries haven't increased at all and the cost of living has, but I think it also goes back to that point that I said before about the values, right? There's nothing wrong with a nice house. You should the want question, that. The question is, is the house because this is in alignment with your values and every financial decision I'm making aligns with our values or is the house because I have to impress my neighbors, my family, my mother-in-law, 
And this is where we get really, really stuck. I love that. You know, it's so funny because in today's day and age, yesterday I had on my dear friend, he's a plastic surgeon. So I say to him, you know, David, he goes, I just want to travel. And I go, and unfortunately in COVID, we can't do that. And believe me, I have the travel bug. I was told by two astrologists, you got to go to Hawaii. The next day I was in Hawaii, wrote my first book. I mean, literally just let me go on a plane, right? But yeah, the fact is that today, especially with people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, you know, that white picket fence, American, American mm. dream doesn't really exist anymore because mm -hmm. people really want to be making the beautiful Instagram photos on the beach somewhere else but their home. And yet we're taking on this really huge debt in order to live at home, which is our mortgage, rent payment, if you're not, if you're not you know, car payments, taxes. Mm -hmm. taxes. I mean, the taxes, just my move from California to Colorado, it's a 10% almost difference in state income tax. Mm -hmm. People are really looking at this today. I mean, California is losing people in droves. New York is losing people in droves. And they're coming to places like Texas, like Florida, because right. it's welcoming. It's saying, come, make your money here. We're not going to tax you on it. Right. But we know that you're going to be spending at our restaurants. You're going to be spending at our hair salons. You're going to be putting into the economy, buying our homes. So yeah. I think these governments have a lot to, to think about. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And I, I think, listen, I think we live in a really fast paced world. And yes, we're, you know, we're constantly in this phone and, and Instagram and this and that we have to make space to have these really very honest conversations. Who am I? What's my purpose? What's my soul calling? What lights me up? What are my values? And am I living according to those values? And is my, my money financing those values? And if we're married, we have to have those conversations with our spouse. We have to really integrate that, you know, like, you don't just talk about this before you get married. You have to constantly be discussing. It's yes. ebb and flow. It truly, and money, like you said, has a way of getting away from you if you do not take care of that money, care for that money. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, I'll, and I'll tell you, as a young girl, I made a lot of money in my legal practice. And I also spent a lot of money. I did too. <laughs> You know, and, and at some point you look and you say, what the hell am I doing buying my mom and sisters and everybody a Chanel bag? Mm -hmm. So it's amazing when you make money at a young age, especially you don't have those things that you have to pay for. You don't have the mortgage yet. You don't have the kids tuition bill yet. You don't have kids yet. And, and truly being, and I'm in the business, right? So are you. But we so often, especially as younger people, without the responsibilities, we can blow that money. Yep. Which is why these conversations are so important. It's so important for the younger women to hear this now and understand that you're making that money, then now stay, start taking care of it. Start living the way you want to live. Don't live for others. Because at the end of the day, you can buy the Chanel bag for your mother or your sister. But really, are you buying it because you want their approval? Like, I made it in the world. Here, let me show you, right? Is there something more in that relationship that you could be giving so that you're taking care of that relationship and nurturing it and taking care of yourself also? And these are, again, they're tough and honest conversations to have. But the earlier we start having them, the sooner this universe says, Oh, you're my kind of material. I have abundance for you. You could take care of things for me, you know? Yeah, I'm me. with you. And you know, to me, the, the kind of breaking point was I was sitting with a therapist and I, I thought I'm there because I was in a relationship that I wanted to get out of and blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden she says to me, what's with this like mob boss, I'm going to buy love for everyone in your life. Mm -hmm. And I never went back to her. I was appalled. What do you mean I'm buying love? I am loved. I just happened to 
be able to, and you know what? She was a hundred percent right. And it was that insecurity in myself of I'm not worth love unless mm -hmm. I am buying expensive things for the people who I love. You know, it's so interesting that you said that because something that I always do with my students um, is we look at their money story and the money story that you have is really something on we have it all back here it's all in the subconscious right and it's the it's made up of all the things that we've heard we've done we've experienced with money all throughout our lives and very often we don't know that we're operating because some things we learned as a, at a very young age and we made certain decisions about money that now we're acting based on that, whether it's rational or not. We might've been eight, seven years old. And very often with my coaching clients, we go back to like that earliest money memory, that first thing they can remember about money. And sometimes it's so eye-opening. I should say every time it's so eye-opening that something happened that really set the stage for the way we think about money and the way we use it as a tool to deal with certain unmet needs that we might have. And guess what? The money's never going to meet those needs. Just like the food is not going to meet the needs, right? Some people have really uh, problems with food, right? We got to get deeper. We got to get deeper because it's such a beautiful tool. We could do so much with it. So it's much. like so much good in the world. We need it. So what I, what I love about money, Yale, is that I always wanted to do unbelievable things with my life and business so that I could write the check without anyone's approval. Mm -hmm. And now as a married woman, as a mom, I'm a little bit less, I have to do it all on my own. In fact, the older I and wiser I think I get is no one can do anything on their own. You know, it's, it's really about, are you in alignment? What kind of work have you done in yourself? And your big why. Mm -hmm. And if it's only about yourself, it's not going to happen. Right. It has to be from the inside out. Totally. 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 It has to be from the inside out. And again, because we're here to serve. We're, it's not about me. It's about something greater, so much greater. And that money is one of the ways in which I could, I could impact. I could use it for the greater good because, you know what I mean? And just like everything, all the other resources that we have. It's how am I serving with this? 100%. So yeah, Elle, if you could give us the top three things that you teach your clients and that you wish everyone knew so that they would live a happier, healthier, more prosperous life, what would your top three be? Ooh, okay. So I'll tell you my top three. Number one, number one, we've touched upon this. Find your unique calling and by God, monetize it. It's going to come naturally. Stop thinking you can't make money at doing and being who you are. Stop worrying about that. You know that it says, I was just reading this in the, there's a safer called the Hayam Yum, a book called Hayam Yum, that it says over there that I'm going to send you a picture of it, Please. that if a person is, 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 if a person has a talent as a, as a, a polishing diamonds or gems, and he works as a baker, that is actually a sin, even though bread is very, very much needed. Can you believe that? Meaning you have to, if you were born with a certain talent, you have to find your livelihood in that realm. That's where you're needed. So yes, people need bread. People need to eat. But you, you're not supposed to be a baker. You're supposed to be polishing gems or doing whatever else you need. So that's number one. That's number one. Number two would be look at what you want, the life you want to live and fund it. Don't use your money to fund somebody else's dreams and life. What are my values? If you look back at your life at the end of your life, you get a very clear picture of you picture. Imagine yourself. What was important? Natalie, this pandemic has peeled so many layers. We're all okay. very, very in tune with what's really of the essence. Now let's tune into that and say, this is important. Community is important. Family is important. Marriage is important. Whatever those things are for you. Now fund those things. Don't neglect them neither with your time nor your money. 
Okay. So that's number three. And then, I mean, number two, and then number three, always tell my clients, you have to allow your money to work for you. You have to invest it. You can't just leave it in the bank or leave it on your, your mattress losing value over time. You can't. And it's not as hard as you think. It's just one baby step at a time, but you have to know that the money flows like a river, you know, and that relieves so much anxiety. People think it's like a lake, you know, like it's going to dry up. No, no, it's not going to dry up. Okay. Make it work. When you think it's going to dry up, it will dry up. Yeah, exactly. You have to, and what I love, Yael, is the open hand, open to receive and open also to give. Yes. hundred percent, hundred percent, hundred percent. And Yael, as a mother, what are the things you're teaching your children about money? Oh my gosh. I love this question. Love, love this question. I want to tell you something. My husband and I have a weekly, we call it a money date. And I know weekly sounds like, oh my gosh, they're real nerds. We are real nerds, but like we have four kids. There's a lot of balls flying. There's a lot of things that need to get financed. You know, this kid goes to school out of state, whatever it is. Right. So we like to have a regular, you know, touch base with the cash flow. Where's the thing? And so one day, it's going to answer your question. One day, one of my kids walks into one of our money dates and they walk past the computer and they see one of our bank accounts open and they see God's blessings account. And he goes to his sibling, what's God's blessings account? Or he says that, right? And the older sibling says, oh, that's mommy and daddy's charity fund. And I was like, everybody gets it. Okay. So number one here, our kids always know that from whatever money they get, whether before birthday or bar mitzvah, Hanukkah, whatever it might be, we always give. They see that we do it. It's a family value. There's always 10 to 20%, 10% minimum, but I'm already, thank God, at a place where I give 20. But my kids for sure have to give 10%. It's not a question. And it's not because we, it's something that parents impose on you. It's because they know that that money was never theirs. Just like my husband and I know that that money was never ours. It's yeah. just that God entrusted us to. Now use it to help other people. So that's number one. Charity for my kids, always. You know, you always do it. Then they always know that we have to save. And believe it or not, they also save long-term. Like all my kids always say, this mommy, you can put in my regular savings account and then the rest, will you take it to my investments account? So I was like, so I do that. Yeah, I transfer it. Team, you and I are writing a book for children on how to properly get them we should. ready. Let's we do should. It. That. We should totally do it. We should totally do it. I actually wrote one in Spanish. So let's use all that. Let's put it together. I mean, it's like an ebook thingy, but yeah. And so it's very nice because, and they, one of my kids asked me the other day, so what's that money going to be for exactly? I'm like, when you grow up, you get to decide you want to buy yourself a house. You want to go on a family trip. I don't know what you're going to do with that money, but it's been growing for you. It's going to be growing for you all these years. Like, Oh, the other day I showed my daughter how much she'd made this year. And she's like, wow, really? Okay. Keep putting that money in there, mommy. <laughs> my daughter is two years old and thank God the 529 was a 38% this year. I said, Sam, why aren't you investing our money the same way? <laughs> investing our money. I, know. I know. I know. So I think those things are very key. And also they hear us talking about it. I think we have to normalize the money conversation. You know, like I'm not shy to tell my kids how much I made in a speaking engagement or how, like I let them know, you know, and like, it's normal. It's normal to charge and it's normal to save and it's normal to invest. A lot of the problem is we have like these taboos. Yeah. So in our family, there's no more taboos, you know, and uh -huh no taboos. And if my kids ask, yeah, I lost a lot of money one time. And, and also during the last recession, my dad, my daddy and mommy lost a lot of money. We had made really bad financial moves and we've learned like, these are things kids need to know. You are giving your child and your children such a gift in life is the vocabulary, the understanding yep. of not just what's a savings account, but to make it a habit. Yep. To make it a habit. And you know, you should also know, by the way, that very often when they ask for something that they want to buy, that is something that it's an extra. And I feel like this month we've allocated money differently. And it's, you know, very often 
we say, how are you going to make money to pay for that? If it's something that my husband and I don't feel like it's a thing, like we need to be putting money in now because we might be saving up for a bar mitzvah or whatever it might be. And very, and, and they're like, very, they're like, but how come other families just buy it? And I, I, that's where I go to the conversation. You know, a lot of families just buy it and they don't own it. Like they literally take things on credit. Half of their house is on credit. More. We don't do that. More, right? We don't do that. If we've allocated money this month to, for other things, we won't pay for something else. Like we get to decide where we put our money. We pay for our present and our future. Like I'm not paying today for my past. That, that was when I was in my 20s. And they're like, they get to have these, they get to wait. They get to see, oh, I have to either work or wait until we're ready to put money into that. Yeah, that's how it works. <laughs> I love it. It's not don't deprive, delay. Yes. And it's also not scarcity. It's, there is the money. It's just, I'm choosing where I'm spending that money. So it's a very different conversation than saying, we don't have money for that. I never tell them that. Like, because it's really not true. I don't believe it. I always believe you can find the money. So how are you going to pay for that? Or we're choosing not to buy that right now, but I have it on my list. In a couple months, I'll get back to you because right now this is what's happening. You know, we're about, you know, whatever we're spending, I'm very open with them. Like yeah. we're saving to go to the beach or we're, you know, whatever it is. What I also love is that you are giving your kids a sense of ownership mm -hmm. on themselves. And that's the most important thing. Truthfully, you know, it's to me like a poor person's game to buy more and more and more. Totally. And it is like the, thank God, the more that we do in the world, the less actual physical stuff I want. It's, Isn't that ironic? It's, but it's true because, you know, what do, what do we then, you know, from the Chanel bag giving me self-worth, which now sits in my closet, because where do I go from my bedroom to my office in my mm -hmm. house? Mm -hmm. It's meaningless to me. Totally. But having these conversations, that's what lights you up. So again, it just goes to the back. It's just going back to that sense of what are we filling up? Like, what's the self-worth that that item is giving us? perhaps you need to get busy doing really meaningful work that lights you up. Like that's very often the case, right? And, or in a very meaningful relationship, right? Whether it be parenthood or marriage or whatever might be a partnership, something's missing. The Chanel bag and the shoes are not going to do it. Nothing wrong with that. Expend on yourself, like treat yourself. I'm not saying I'm, listen, I treat myself plenty, but there is more to this whole money thing. A lot more. You know, it's so funny taking an inventory of what I would spend on pre COVID. Yeah. Manicure, pedicure, foot massage minimum three times a week, body massage, hair blown out, highlights, eating out, coffees every single where. If there was a coffee shop on a corner, I'm hitting it up and I'm getting my. And I'm saying, all of that stuff, none of it means anything. Look, mm -hmm. of course, do I wish I could go get a pedicure right now in like five seconds with none? Of I'm coming with you. Let's do But the fact is, how much? Probably tens of thousands of dollars. Yep. That you don't even feel spending. Because it's not like it's a once in a lifetime thing or I'm buying a computer. You know, something that you're like, okay, this is a bigger thing. I know I'm buying it. The, the expense is going to be a little bit more this month. You look at the credit card and you're like, what the hell happened? I did mm -hmm. nothing. Mm -hmm. Because it's subconscious is running the show. Yep. We're yep. not even thinking that we're spending money. Yeah. We have to be really intentional. We have to be intentional. Uh, and it's really eye-opening because then you, you don't do it on autopilot. You go do those things and you actually enjoy them. Like you, you know, like you... I, I don't know how to explain it. It's they're like special again. They're special again. Exactly. Exactly. And again, it's like a treat. I've been working so hard doing what I love, for example. Now I'm treating myself to a massage rather than I hate my job. So, I mean, and I hate my boyfriend and I'm in a r lousy relationship. I'm going for a massage. You see the difference? <laughs> it's night and day. One is nourishment. The other one is hiding. Uh-huh. It's all about the intentions we put out in the world and what we do comes back to us. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, Al, you are a love and a beautiful light in this world. Thank, Thank you. you for joining us at the Gold Standard today. I have so enjoyed our conversation and I can't wait to have you back. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Natalie.